Hello everyone, my name is Megan DeTemple and I'm here with Jake Henry and we're pleased to present on the floral biology and pollination ecology of Penstemon sepalulis, an endemic Utah wildflower. Penstemon, commonly known as the beard tongues, is the largest group of flowering angiosperms native to North and Central America. The genus comprises of more than 250 species and can tolerate climates found in every state in the continental U.S., including Alaska. One of the unique features of penstemon is its stamen arrangement. It has four functional stamens and one non-functional stamen, known as a staminode. What specifically attracted us to study penstemon, however, are their pollinators. Penstemon flowers are pollinated by bees, wasps, um, long-tongued flies, butterflies, moths, and hummingbirds. So the particular penstemon species that we were looking at for our study is the little cup beard tongue. Um, scientific name Penstemon sepalulis. Um, this penstemon is native to the southern Wasatch Range um, in Utah County and the mountains there right behind Provo and American Fork area. Um, these here are pictures of Penstemon sepalulis growing um, up on the mountainside. They really like rocky slopes um, where the ground has been disturbed and they have some fresh soil to grow from. Um, their flowers are this vibrant purple. Um, there are many shoots coming off from the plant with kind of narrow leaves. Um, they grow in little uh, bunches of anywhere from a handful of plants to, uh, up to a couple dozen of plants together at once. So here's some more inf general information about Penstemon sepalulis. On um, the right here is a distribution map of where it grows. Uh, this is made up of both physical, physical herbarium um, collections that we looked at, as well as um, observations on the um, Citizen Science app iNaturalist. Um, and we can see that the, uh, the range is in the southern Wasatch range here. It goes from like American Fork, Mount Tibinogos area, and Lehigh, um, up through Provo Canyon and Rock Canyon, um, down to Springville and Spanish Fork with a handful of populations in Spanish Fork and down into Santa Clan area, uh, Mount Nebo. Um, Pensma sepalulis blooms in June to July. It can grow anywhere from down on the valley all the way up to the top of these mountains. Um, and the thing that we wanted to know about this Pensman in particular is what pollinates it. Um, we had not seen previously any studies or any observations about you know whether it was insects or hummingbirds or what kind of insects came to pollinate this rare and relatively restricted um, rare flower that was growing here in our own neighborhood up in the mountains. So here are some up close pictures of the flowers of Penstemon sepalulis, this beautiful gorgeous lavender purple color. Um, so in our considerations I'm asking what um, pollinates Penstemon sepalulis, the floral shape and structure can help give us a good idea. And this is what we looked at before we actually started collecting pollinators. Um, with Penstemon sepalulis, um, it grows kind of at a horizontal angle out from the, the stem of the plant. Um, and that gives you know, bees or wasps or other insects a good landing pad, you can say. As they fly down and land, they can crawl inside. Um, to try and get down to the nectar at the bottom or the base of the flower. Um, as they're crawling down inside, they will rub their backs up against those um, there's anthers, anthers there, which will deposit pollen onto their back and allow them to pollinate uh, the other penstemon. Um, a characteristic of, uh, of penstemon genus is the staminode. Um, the staminode is a sterile stamen, which does not have an anther on the end. Um, you can see it here if you look on this bottom picture. Um, there's a, a tube coming up that goes all the way out to the edge of the petals, or to the to where the tube opens up and the petals kind of flare out. That is the staminode. On other penstemon, um, the staminode can often be described as hairy. That's why they're called beard tongues. Um, on penstemon sepalulis, however, the staminode is completely hairless. Um, this is potentially an indicator that you know, this can be pollinated by hummingbirds, whereas most bee-pollinated penstemon tend to have a more hairy staminode. 
So these are considerations that we took a look at with the flower as we were uh, just trying to figure out what exactly pollinated this flower. In order to answer these questions, we picked three locations using Intermountain Biota and iNaturalist that represent the entire range of P. cephalulus. We chose American Fork, Provo Canyon, and Slate Canyon. They include ele elevations between 5,300 feet and 7,400 feet. From there, we decided to do observations in 20-minute time blocks. In each time period, we captured all the pollinators we could using nets, we euthanized the insects using ethyl acetate, and stored them in 100% ethanol for further identification and pinning. We did 12 20-minute observations for each of the following time periods, from 8 to 10 a.m., 12 to 2 p.m., 4 to 6, 8 to 10. Specimens were identified down to orders and families with the help of an entomologist and identification keys. Finally, nectar concentration was measured using a low-volume BRICS refractometer. So here are a handful of pictures of the floral visitors that we captured um, visiting our Penstemon septulus flowers as we were doing our study. Um, the most common ones that we found were uh, across the different populations were these pollen wasps and the family Vespidae, subfamily Masarinae, and they are uh, characterized and easily identified from other wasps by these clubbed antenna that they have. You see the top one has a small kind of shorter clubbed antenna there under its eye and the one on the bottom left there has some longer more dramatic clubbed antenna. And we think we have a, a handful of different varieties or species of pollen wasps that we captured. Um, across these different populations. Um, we captured a variety of other bees and um, wasps and uh, bumblebees in both the Apidae and uh, Megachylidae families as well. Um, another common one that we found was this bottom right picture here that is a mason bee. Um, that was another common visitor that we collected along with this other vibrant um, kind of uh, iridescent one in the top right. These pictures illustrate some more of the, uh, the bees or the bumblebees that we collected um, from these locations. They ranged in sizes. This one on the top left was quite large, um, whereas this one on the bottom right was significantly smaller. Um, a huge variety of native bees, um, as well as you know, other pollinators. There are a handful of other flies and um, insects like that that we captured as well which we were unsure if they're actually pollinators, but they were visitors to the flowers. So, But we had a, a large variety of these native bees and other um, Masarini and Apidae that visited these flowers as well. Now let's quantify the insect visitors we saw. Here we see three different graphs, each one for each location. Um, and here on the x-axis we have the observation time, when we collected the visitor, um, on the y-axis, we have the average number of visitors, um, and um, those are subdivided into four different groups, Masarinae, Megachylidae, Apidae, and finally an other category. Um, and we were interested in seeing how each visitor group was different from corresponding visitor groups at the same time in different locations which is kind of a mouthful, but here you see the table here, um, and the bolded values are ones showing significant p-values. And what's interesting in this figure here is that we notice that the most abundant visitor is different in each location. For example, look here in American Fork. In American Fork, there were, in the afternoon, there were a lot of apidae, and significantly more compared to Timpanogos here or Slate Canyon. Similarly in Slate Canyon, there were a lot on average of Masarinae in the afternoon compared to American Fork or Timpanogos. And finally in Timpanogos here we see a lot of visitors that fall in the other category compared to American Fork. And so overall the big takeaway is that it looks like each location was dominated by different visitors. Um, which was unexpected for us. So this graph here illustrates the uh, different visitor groups that visited the different locations that we looked at. 
Um, so the three locations, again, are American Fork, Slate Canyon, and Tipinogus. Um, and you can see there's a quite a difference in the pollinators that visit these different locations. For example, in American Fork, um, if you look at the blue there, the Apidae, we had by and far um, more than anything else there that we collected were these these large bumblebees, you know, a kind of uh, orange-backed bumblebees that would come and visit these penstemon flowers there. We caught relatively, comparatively, relatively few uh, pollen wasps there, the Masarnae. Uh, in American Fork. Whereas in Slate Canyon, we captured a lot of the pollen wasps, the Masarnae, as well as a lot of mason bees, the Megchylidae, uh, but very relatively few Apidae there, along with a variety of other um, visitors, which includes some other flies and insects. Um, when Tipinogus, um, there was a lot of variety there as well. We didn't find any of the bumblebees hardly. Um, but there were a lot of other visitors, along with a handful of pollen wasps and mason bees as well. In addition to the insect um, visitors, we did observe two broad-tailed hummingbirds um, coming and visiting our pinspin flowers as well. Here we have a box plot showing the average sucrose concentration in bricks for each location. We additionally included measurements from Pensamin etonii, which is considered as a flower pollinated principally by hummingbirds. Previous studies have shown that hummingbird pollinated flowers have a lower sucrose concentration, but a much higher volume than bee pollinated flowers. Additionally, here we included p-values to indicate significant di differences between sucrose averages. As you can tell, there was some variation between different locations. We are not sure if this is due to genetic variation, habitat differences, or both. Further studies may help distinguish these differences. Um, in general, it appears that P. sepalulis has a wide range of sucrose concentrations um, and that they may not cater to a specific pollinator um, like P. Pensamin etonii. So in conclusion, although Pensamin sepalulis has a relatively limited range here in the southern Wasatch Mountains in Utah Valley, it has evolved to attract an unexpectedly wide variety of pollinators, uh, ranging from bees to butterflies to hummingbirds uh, and to other pollen wasps, um, showing that this plant is happy to be pollinated by anything that will come its way. Thank you for listening to our presentation.